that take a look at, at each other and challenge each other about what's authentic and what's not authentic. Um, and so we're just so, so honored that we have this partnership with the LARC uh, for second year because we, we have so many, um, you know, variables that we share. Um, and they've just been really great for us and great to us. Um, thanks, John Eisner, Michael Robertson. Um, everyone here at the LARC has just been wonderful, and so we're so happy that we are in love. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, and so, um, but I also just want to mention funders and a couple other things before I, the panel. Yes, special shout out to the New York uh, State Council on the Arts and the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs. Yes, the Four Foundation, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. And on that note, uh, one thing that you can do, ev everything that we do here at the LARC uh, is completely free of admission. Um, uh, all the money that we raise is contributed income from individuals and institutions. So if you're in a position to make any kind of donation, whether it's five cents or five million dollars, there's a little pink birdhouse up on the, the table where you uh, enter, um, and you can put uh, any donation. You know, if you're in a position to do that, yeah. And we're gonna share that. We'll stuff. share. We'll so share the birdhouse. We got a we got a joint thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, <laughs> the, that's the spirit of our marriage. Um, yeah. So uh, for, for those of you who are actually watching, because actually we're being live streamed, so you can be active audience participants and all that. We're being live streamed. So you can follow us on Twitter at The New Black Fest and also at Lark Talks. And uh, during the panel conversation and post conversation, you can tweet live. You can also provide questions for the panel. So do that at home. You can also do it here in the audience. Um, is there anything else we need to? Turn off your cell phones, please. And if you stick around afterwards, we're going to open up a couple of bottles of wine and have some snacks in the lobby so you can yes. hang out and mingle with the panelists and each other. Yes. And uh, I'm going to I'm going to leave now. Let you. So before the panel begin, begins. Um, for those of you uh, who are not aware of the whole week, the week is starting tonight to kick off panel. Um, tomorrow night is Lisa Strong's, um, let me read this correctly because uh, I got it wrong in the past. Um, Lisa Strong's, She Gon' Learn. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. She Gon' Learn, by, directed by Ngozi Anyawu. Um, on March 16th at 7 p.m., it's Merit by Linnell Moyes, directed by Nicole A. Watson. Um, March 17th at 7 p.m., Porn Play or Blessed Be the Meek by Eric Michael Holmes, directed by Carl Cofield. And on March 18th at 7 p.m., School Girls or the African Mean Girls Play by Jocelyn Beale, directed by Jay King Carroll. And March 19th at 7 p.m., When We Left by Sangu, directed by Steven, Steven Brodnax. All right? Woo! So, the panel for tonight, the panel for tonight, the white gaze, the truth gaze, and a new revolution. Um, moderating tonight is Nicole Salter. I'm going to say a few things about her. Arrived on the scene with her co-authorship and co-performance with Denai Guerrero of the Pulitzer Prize nominated in the continuum. Um, yes, she received Independent Reviewers of New England <laughs> uh, Reviewers New England Award nomination for Best Actress for Stick Fly, co-produced by Arena Stage and Huntington Theater, and was recently seen in the West Coast premiere of McCraney's Head of Passes at Berkeley Rep Theater. Salter has written six plays, been commissioned by six institutions. She's been produced on three continents in five countries and published in 12 international publications. The National Black Theater's production of her play, Carnival, was nominated for seven adult boy awards. Yes. Um, <laughs> Salter's deep sense of social responsibility led her to co-found with Sangu the, the Continuum Project Incorporated, a nonprofit organization that creates innovative artistic programming for community empowerment. So that is Nicole Salter, our moderator. Woo our panelists tonight. Dorian Missick, um, actor, paved his way onto the scene with, when he starred opposite Sandra Bullock and Hugh Grant in Two Weeks Notice. Most recently seen on the big screen in the Jerry Brokheimer produced Deliver Us from Evil and Christmas's season hit Annie. Uh, currently, Missick stars opposite R&B Superstar Brandy in the new BET series Zoe Ever After, and as the lead and executive producer of the film Nine Rides, which just premiered at South by Southwest. Yeah. Right? Just Brandy. got back today. Yeah, right? just got back today. Yes, yes. yes. Mm -hmm. uh, recurring roles on the AMC series Better Call Sal and the HBO comedy series The Brink. Missick also starred off Broadway in the Pulitzer Prize winning drama A Soldier's Play opposite Anthony Mackie and Tate Diggs at Second Stage. 
Um, next uh, for our panel is Michael Denzel Smith, is a nobler, am I saying that right? <laughs> uh, a nobler fellow at the Nation Institute and a contributing writer for The Nation magazine. He has written for The New York Times, The Atlantic, Salon, Feministine.com, The Guardian, The Root, The Grio, Think Progress, Think Progress, and The Huntington, Huntington Post. He has been featured commentator on NPR, BBC Radio, CNN, MSNBC, Huffington Post Live, and another of other amazing television and radio programs. His new memoir, Invisible Man Got the Whole World Watching, published by Nation Books, is out June 14th, right? June 14th, yes. Kia Corcoran, finally. Um, playwright and novelist and good friend. Um, first novel, The Castle Cross the Magna Carta, was released by Seven Stories Press in January. Her, reward, her awards for her body of work in playwriting include the White Hem Campbell Prize for Drama, the U.S. Artist Jane Addams Fellowship, the Simon Great Plains Playwriting Award, the Lee Reynolds Award, and in May she will be honored with the Otto Award. Productions have premiered in New York by BAM, Playwrights Horizons, Ensemble Studio Theater, New York Theater Workshop, Atlantic Theater Company, Manhattan Theater Club, London, she was at Darmar Warehouse, the Royal Court, she's been produced everywhere. Amazing playwright. Um, so, that is all I'm going to say. Um, thank you for being here. Take it away, Nicole. Take it away. Mondays, 
all the white kids would come and talk about uh, what happened on the Brady Bunch. And I never knew because my family watched Sanford and Son. So now, <laughs> looking back, I'm really proud of that. But at the time, I was like, I had nothing to say in the conversation. Um, which is kind of, that's, a, uh, of course, a minor kind of funny thing. I can remember other things like the time in gym class when I was like a whole bunch of girls before gym class started. And one of them told this funny joke. And uh, there was like 14 girls, maybe. And I was the only black one. And she whispered it to her friend. And they just like cracked up. And then other people said, what's the joke? And they said, oh, we can't tell that joke. And before gym class started, they had whispered to every single girl, but not me, this, whatever this joke was, <laughs> even though that no one ever looked at me. But I was the only one who didn't get to hear this joke. In my writing, I, of course, a lot of time has gone by since then, but uh, I, I'm so into my characters that I feel like I don't feel that because I'm so into who they are that I'm not, that I really am not thinking about the outside. I'm thinking about this moment with them. Do you think Michael and the White Gaze has an impact on your work? Consciously or subconsciously? It has an impact on all of our work. Um, oh, sorry. I think, uh, sort of piggyback on what Dorian was saying, uh, white gaze is essentially uh, another way for white supremacy to shackle our imaginations and mm -hmm. define our, the existence of people who are non white. Uh, and that your first introduction to the world, um, the society that we live in, is through the white gaze, I think, for the most part, you are, you, you, you've been born into a definition um, that you either have to accept or reject at some point. Um, and unless you are actively unlearning, looking at yourself and looking at the world through that white gaze, uh, it's going to have an impact on the things you believe But even if you don't, I mean, we, can, we can all just become consumed with it because it's so dominant, it's such a big force. Uh, it is it's, it's central to uh, so much of American cultural output um, to, to break yourself away from that, to pull away uh, and ask yourself different questions based on your own perception of the world, absent That all the work is derivative of the same boat anyway. should watch the Brady Bunch or that there was a, 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 a sense of normalcy that was established. When did you realize that you, that you didn't sit permanently inside that? You sort of answered that with your, your anecdote about the Brady Bunch. Uh, I'll take the beat. Uh, I was, uh, I, I, I was, my parents sent me to private school at a very early age. So I was oftentimes you know, the only black face in a very white place. And um, that's when I started, because you, you you learn from an earlier, you know, kindergarten and first grade on, you kind of learn your, you become socialized. And so my social circle were 
mostly white kids in school, but at home and in my family, I was around people who looked like me, and we had a different set of uh, activities. And I remember going to school, and and my principal's husband, who just used to sit outside and kind of just dictate things. He was kind of an overseer in, a way, in that way. I hate to, I hate to, actually, I don't hate to use that term, because that's what I think he thought he was. <laughs> and um, he would constantly wait to see what I was wearing in school. You know, and say, turn your hat around, boy. But everybody on my block would have backwards. You know, and, and my friends in school celebrated it. Mm -hmm. But this guy was like, you cannot step foot into this area until you turn your hat around. And um, then I started to realize that a lot of the things that I did seemed to get on his nerves. And they were just me existing. Mm -hmm. And that's when I realized, oh, he, he's trying to make me fit in more with what he's comfortable with. It has nothing to do with what I'm comfortable with. Mm -hmm. It has everything to do with what he's comfortable with. And I think that was the very beginnings of me kind of starting to get to a place of not really giving a shit, you know, mm -hmm. about what that, because I realized it was way more about him than it was about my, and this is like first oh, grade. First grade. first grade when I really started to feel it, because I had so much pride in my family. My family, West Indian, and we have a lot of pride. Mm -hmm. And so I, I grew up feeling happy with who I was. I had many problems with even, you know, and I, I didn't think, it never occurred to me that other people had a problem with who I was. Mm -hmm. Because my white friends, you know, some of them, uh, they came from different places and, and they all had pride in who they were. And, and you know, we had not yet all been conditioned to be racist towards each other. Right. You know, so it was cool. I was the coolest kid because I could run the fastest. I had nothing to do with being black, white, whatever, you know. Uh, although he probably would have told me it had something to do with me being black, the fact that I could run fastest. But that it, it wasn't until this guy uh, kept imposing upon me his concept that I realized, you know, it's not that important to be like you. I don't, I don't, I don't want to live my life according to your standards. But, uh, you know, that's a struggle that you, once you decide to, to not do that, you think that you're going to have some allies in your own community, but you sometimes don't. And you definitely don't have allies in, in any, in, you know, the gaze is not for you. But the people who, who look like you, you think would support that movement. And I, I found, found out very quickly when the next black kid came to school that he wasn't about that living outside the box life. He that was not for him. He, yeah, he was like, listen, dude, if you want to get along here, you're going to, yeah, matter of fact, take that hat off and um, talk like these guys. And that's when I started to realize there's something very different about uh, how people respond to the gays, so to speak. Michael.
understanding of what it means to be other, and then understanding that no matter what definition uh, I could want for myself, in the context of whiteness, in the context of white supremacy, the white gaze, whatever moniker we want to throw on top of it, uh, it can be and will be used to denigrate my humanity. Yeah, I think the first time that I realized, not that, not, it wasn't the first time I realized that there was a white gaze. I knew that I was black and that the other kids were white. But the first time I realized that there was a, a, a power dynamic within that difference was in like the brownies, and uh, we were um, we went on trips around the world, but not around the world, like to different museums. Um, and uh, we were going to Australia to see the kangaroos, and uh, one of the, my brownie sisters told me that I couldn't go because there are no black people in Australia. And at the time, I didn't, it didn't it didn't impact me harshly at all. I was like, oh, yeah. She was like, yeah, you can't go. <laughs> there are no black people there? She's like, no. And I was like, oh, okay, well, I'll catch y'all when y'all go to South America. You know, like, um, <laughs> but, but, it, but to realize that I couldn't do something now was, the, was an interesting change. So speaking of not being able to do or being able to do something, what impact does the white gaze, when did you realize that there was a white gaze in your work? How has that impacted you as you developed your career? <laughs> Thank you, Michael. <laughs> That's an honest question. Um, oh, okay. Nothing else. 
you know, everything else white, 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 and this continued, you know, somewhat into college, but when I became, you know, as a young woman, I mean, of course, is this happened in fact, and the racism there, but in terms of my work, I really, I just so am into that character. I mean, in the book, there's two white brothers and two black brothers, and whatever character I'm completely into it, and I don't think about that. In the course of my life, sometimes that's, for whatever reason, I, you know, my career is like this, you know, sometimes I'm working really well, sometimes I'm not, but, um, and for whatever reason that is, but uh, uh, I don't consciously compromise, is what I'll say, or consciously not compromise. I'm just like so into the characters, I'm not thinking about it. What about the audition? Uh, I mean, I think there's been a lot of discussion about, you know, the opportunities for black performers and actors in, in, in the industry. But I think that where it affected, it affects me the most is initially the, the whole thing about we police ourselves, you know. So you think that the answer is, oh, let me work with some black folks, you know, so then we can tell some stories that showcase us in a full, uh, in a full light, you know, living a complete life. But a lot of times the decision makers are go along, get along. So they've already, they've already policed themselves and decided, well, I'm going to tell the story that I know will be accepted as opposed to telling the truth. So then in a way, you still kind of just sign up for a home show, you know, and it's just your, the director might be. Whatever, you know, you might do things for you that to make you think you feel more comfortable in it. And so what I did constantly in the early uh, stages of my career was I would pressure my reps to go out the roles that weren't written black. And that's, you know, for about three years, you just bang your head against the wall. And then they figure out the trick. You can start getting roles that are written for, that are not necessarily written in black, but they'll be like the least developed guys in the script that would generally go to like fat white guys. Then you do the cool acting, you know. So you still don't really get to do anything. But they say, "Well, listen, you know, this guy was supposed to be, you know, bad Italian dude. Now it's you, you know." Blind <laughs> <laughs> casting, you know. But you still don't get to feel like you're living a a, a full life. And I remember there was a, a huge, huge, huge Hollywood film that I um, ended up getting fired from as a result of uh, in the rehearsal process because it was the moment when I realized these people are. This industry is not going to, if I play the game by their rules, I'm never going to be able to live a full life. That's not dictated by a white person's definition of who I'm supposed to be. So it was a film that ended up making, I mean, a huge hit movie. And I was supposed to play this rapper. And it was sitting in a room full of dudes who listen like, look like they'd never listened to rap music before. And they're telling me how to go about playing a rapper. Mm. And I was like, mm, I'm, you know, listen, I, I don't know about this. Now, the other guys in the, in the cast, uh, my, my, my white cast members, they have opinions about how their roles are supposed to be played in this thing. The director was very open. The writer was very clear and open and loved all of their input. And I'm the one, and I'm talking about guys who are playing, like, you know, characters that are so far from who they are, but yet he's so open to what they have to say. And I'm playing a character that's sort of close to the bone. I mean, I'm not a rapper, but... Uh, you know, listen, I'm a black dude who grew up in the 90s. I know a lot of rappers. Oh. You know? <laughs> <laughs> you know, we all rap. So I was like, listen, you know, I have, I have things that I like to contribute to that will make this character a little more realistic because we, there's some problematic moments here. And so not being looked at as a collaborator. Right. And within the white gaze. Uh, yeah, exactly. Exactly. You're like, listen, this is what we wrote, man. Be comfortable. Just be happy you're here. And then that's when I realized, oh, it's not because they haven't met someone who's willing to speak out. It's because they don't want to meet someone who's willing to speak out. And then that is, it was, I, I went out of my way to get fired from that situation. Uh, <laughs> 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 yeah, 
And he really, really, manifesto. And he really <laughs> was. Like, yeah, he let me walk away. He's one of the rare times that's ever happened. And it, it, as a result, I, I walked away feeling way more empowered. I was a lot poorer as a result. <laughs> when the movie was a hit, most of my friends were like, hey, that movie's making a lot of money. You could have blown up. And all I kept thinking was, that would have been the last movie I ever made in my whole career. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. I might have jumped off a building somewhere. Or you might have just, you know, like, never seen me again. Because the guy who played the role, I've never seen him again. You know, they found a guy who went along the old long. He didn't, he didn't do it. They fired, I'm going to just say, they fired a real rapper after me. They hired a real rapper <laughs> to play a part after me. I run into this real rapper because I'm black and young, I know a lot of rappers. So I ran into the real rapper. And I was like, oh man, I heard they hired you after they fired me. He's like, man, they fired me today. What? <laughs> saying I, I, it is, but you have to, you are definitely making a uh, sacrifice in some way, whether it be a social sacrifice, um, accepting the fact that you are not going to be as socially accepted as those who, go, who decide to play the by the rules, or a financial sacrifice. And it's about your uh, threshold of pain. You know, uh, it's a shame that in order to be yourself in this society, you have to be willing to uh, succumb to some sort of pain just to be allowed to tell your own story or to live your life in a way that you're comfortable with. But uh, once you make that adjustment, mentally, for me at least, um, I was, you find that you decide where, you, where your peace comes from. Is it playing along or is it doing what I'm most comfortable with? Because no matter what, we're going to make some, I mean, that's what living in this world is about, you know, you know figuring out how to, how to get along with everyone. To a certain degree, so you're going to make some sacrifices, and it's just a, it's just a depends on how serious the sacrifice you want to make. Yeah, I guess it depends on where and how you're seeing the impact of the white gaze. So, if the idea is one um, where you are sacrificing. Yeah. 
whiteness is the, the sort of operational uh, definition of the, the standard and the We're oppressive. black because you're white. The oppressive, yeah. yeah. Um, so, so yes, from position of, uh, from that position, yes, you're going to. I think that the issue is less, are you going to, are you going to engage it or not? Um, it's about <laughs> which of its definitions, which of its lies do you still hold dear uh, and believe have value? And <coughs> why? Why do you continue to traffic in those lies? Um, and two, why the obsession to the point that you can't see the rest of uh, blackness and, and humanity within blackness? Uh, I think it, you know, for me, it's valuable thinking through this. And, um, you know, Ishmael Reed is still mad about the color purple. Right. <laughs> <laughs> he is still mad. Tell me about it. Like, and why is he mad? It's because Alice Walker decided not to engage the white gaze as much. What did she do? She decided to look at the, from pers the look at these stories from the perspective of black women, of black queer women, in that situation. And what that did was then implicate in oppression black men, right? And once you throw off the white, once you once you step outside of the white gaze just a bit and you start delving into the factors that uh, impact us within our community, you start dealing with the messiness of all of that, and right. it's Im implicating people and seeing where you are complicit in your own privilege and power and oppression and where you derive uh, uh, from your identity. And that starts to piss people off because whiteness is such a common enemy for us that we can all rally behind that particularly within the confines of a uh, heteropatriarchal understanding of what liberation looks like. If we can all rally behind the idea that the white man is the evil one and we can all, we, then we all just have to set aside all of the other differences and we can do that. But it does not take into account everything else that's happening in the community and all of the, the power play within there and the, the replication and reproduction of power structures within our community on the basis of gender and sexual identity and class differences and so on and what have you. Um, so, so the idea is not even then that you can't throw off the white gaze. Um, the problem is once you do, uh, you start opening up this can of worms that asks different questions of people that they don't want to have to deal with. So I did a writing residency at Hedgebrook um, while I was there. There was a woman there named Holly Near who was a folk singer. And one of the things that struck me about our, our fireside conversations was how much she um, felt as though, or seemed to in that moment, I won't speak for her life, but in that moment to feel as though the sacrifices that she made to create freedom songs um, actually didn't free nobody. And how if she had um, integrated herself more into the quote unquote mainstream, which is really just a euphemism, <coughs> this white gaze. Um, she could have done more. What's to be said about both changing systems from the inside out? And what do you think about all of the initiatives, particularly in the theater world, because I represent TCG, doing a lot with equity, diversity, and inclusion. But even what's going on in Hollywood, all these demands for policy to make sure that everyone is uh, able to participate. Thank you. 
people are, you know, have the power in this country. So, and this, I guess, it sort of applies to what you're saying too. So, um, I wrote a novel, and I didn't self-publish it, and, and you know, take it into a black community and only sell it to black people. So, uh, is that part of the white gaze? Is it? Is it because uh, whites have had the power that they could publish novels first? Is that mean that, that it's always an invitation? I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm honestly not sure. I'm not like asking that. It's not sarcasm. It's actually, I guess it depends on how you define it. I mean, I guess you could say anything we do in this country, white people probably did it first. And so is it because they had the power to? Because we were picking cotton. So, so uh, yeah, is it all an imitation? I don't know. You got me thinking. God bless the people that want to work within institutions and change them, because they have patience that I just do not. Um, <laughs> because institutions are built to protect themselves. Yeah. Yeah. They are built to perpetuate themselves, and so they are resistant to change just by nature. They are inherently conservative in the sort of small C sense that they do not whatever institution that you're entering into just simply is not going to uh, revolutionize overnight just because you asked it to. Um, and it doesn't matter how many faces, like brown faces that you put within positions of power, what the, the underlying idea is, is to keep this particular institution going. So that, I mean, that cuts across the board. You touch with whatever we want to talk about. Hollywood, we want to talk about writing, we want to talk about politics and government, we want to talk about education, all of it is built to change very slowly. So the idea um, that we just get a whole bunch of us like into the system, and, like when we get some people in positions of power and it changes, and it's just a change, change like, cause, you know, if I got a job, like that's a change. Um, but that's not going to it's not going to produce the type of results that we're looking for immediately. Uh, we do have to be, I mean, you can have the sort of inside out game where it's like, you know, the people with the patience to do that can work themselves into institutions and work their way up the, the corporate ladder and, and do all that while having people agitate from the outside. Um, that, that's just one way of thinking about it. I think, um, you know, all of it's tough. Like, <laughs> there's just no easy answer. There's no easy, like, build our own institutions. Okay, we've got the money to do it. You know, it, it's all tough. There's no one answer. I think the, the thing you just have to do is find out where you fit in. What is it that you do well? Um, what is your temperament suited for? Uh, and then you do that thing. And if it's working within the system, then by all means, go for it. If it's you know, shouting from outside of it to burn it all down, have that sort of institutional knowledge to be able to build something new, uh, we need that too. I'm not suggesting any per if we all focus all of our energy on one or the other because we've tried, we've tried all of that throughout our history here. Um, and what we have to keep in mind is that uh, when white supremacy decides that, okay, that's enough, it shuts it down. Like it is, you know, uh, power will protect itself. Uh, and so, so I mean, we, we're looking for answers and we're all just like, like throwing, throwing ideas on the wall and hoping something sticks and just, just gotta keep doing that. I got very hopeful, I know. <laughs> Down and there's the well, will I get more done? 
if I operate within the institution. Uh, the, the, the tough thing about that is, I think it was Paul Fagan who said in this, in this Slumberland, one of the most revolutionary things you can do, not I'm paraphrasing, is to be yourself. Um, and I think that the truth of existing, particularly here in America, is that the white gaze does exist. So to try to ignore it is to create, uh, you know, a Disneyland of some sort that doesn't exist. Um, so to think that you can, that anything that speaks to our experience here is not at some kind of way uh, affected, I was going to say infected, affected by the, uh, the white gaze. I think it is, is a little uh, uh, naive. I don't, I don't think you can really, I don't think you can do that, so. Um, you don't think it can be changed? Do I think it can be changed? Yeah, with all of our diversity initiatives, and do you think that no. progress? I, I, I mean, I think some progress can be made, but change completely? I, I'm not very confident in that, it's simply because <laughs> Uh, similar to, to what was said earlier about once you take away the, the, the enemy of racism or the enemy of the oppressor, then you have to deal with all the different nuances of our community, of black community in particular. And that, then that, that in and of itself will, will determine other struggles. But what about things like when you look at uh, industries developing, like why don't we say, oh, we want to get out of this white gaze, let's go to Africa, let's go to Nollywood and make our films there. Why don't we do that? Where do you think that money's going? Uh, you know, we have to go to Mars, man. Uh, was, you know, in, in that, if, well, you know, then there's the people who, who are making their money strictly, uh, I guess, what you would consider independent, uh, you know, funding it through their friends and family. And yeah, that, that can definitely be done, but then once again, it, just because a black person is creating it or, or a non-white person is creating it, doesn't mean that every non-white person is going to embrace it. It does not mean that it speaks to every non-white person's experience. So it, at some point, there has, there's going to be a, uh, a, a structure of power. And whether it be White gays, or whether it be light skin black gays, or whether it be black um, silky hair gays, there's going to be something, you know. And so, uh, I think the best thing to do is for the most of you, you know, you know, that's kind of, we know that about that in our community. Good hair versus bad. Hair. Yes, Lord. Chris Rock made a movie about it. <laughs> <laughs> we are live streaming on HowlRound and live streaming on Twitter at the New Black Fest and at Barb Talks using hashtags TNBF16 and. I'm going to open it up to some questions in the audience, and I think we also have questions on Twitter. Um, and here she comes. <laughs> These questions, we don't have answers to the. How do we break the binary of black, white, oppressor, oppressed, power, no power? <laughs> and and after you answer this, we all gonna go skipping down the street happily home. Right. <laughs> end white supremacy. And how do you end white exactly. supremacy, Michael? Exactly. 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 That's the point. And, you know, I mean, I think that people are looking for some practical answer to say today. What can I do at home? right now that will get us out of this, this binary thinking about what blackness and whiteness and, and it's like white supremacy has a 400 plus year head start on you like it has found multiple ways to uh, uh, you know to, to re-ingratiate itself within our political and social and cultural lives that you are not going to find a solution to it right now. We, I mean, our best minds have been at work on it for quite some time. I mean, I had some other, uh, you know, I was, I was at a different panel and we were talking about the concept of liberation and he, said, he came to ask the question and he was like, you know, we had liberation at one point. I was like, what are you talking about? He said, you know, in Tulsa, Black Wall Street. And I was like, you know what they did in Black Wall Street? <laughs> 
They burned it down. down. And yeah. it only existed because they were segregated to it. You, you, you understand, like, the, what happens is white supremacy protects itself. So, um, one, the best thing we can do is survive and hope that we outlast it. Um, but, you know, climate change is going to kill us all before we end white supremacy. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, that's just, don't worry about it. I'll repeat, I'll repeat it so that they'll hear it. Okay. Um, this is in reference to what uh, Michael, you were saying with video camera. I'm talking about right outside the white gaze, uh, when you talk about that the things that are harder to rally behind, um, and that's Yes, so I, she was asking a question about whether or not uh, negative portrayals of African Americans were helpful or harmful in our world of storytelling. Because okay. I feel like I, I, that's a conversation that, that uh, comes up a lot mm -hmm. in, in acting. And I think that it, being honest is the best thing. Mm -hmm. And when you are honest, sometimes the movies will look like precious. Or if you're honest, sometimes the movies don't look like, you know, this Christmas. I don't know. But it's just being brave enough to tell an honest story and not being concerned with how it's going to be received, I think, is that an audience and we as people are very in tune to honesty. So you know when you're being pandered to, and you know when someone's trying to reach a, a broad audience, mm -hmm. and you know when it's something that's very specific. Uh, I, I, Justin Lane has a film called Better Luck Tomorrow, and he's his first film, and it's just about the lives of Asian kids in high school and when they go home, the lives they live. And I was in class with a lot of Asian kids, but I never went home with them, you know? And so watching this movie and seeing just how specific that life was, it it made me turn the mirror back on myself and, and examine how I view people, because I was like, man, I'm thinking these kids just go home and do their homework all the time, and. Uh, maybe help their parents at the store or whatever, and then come back to school. And these kids were getting into drugs and partying and, and yet still coming back and kicking our asses in class. <laughs> you know, and that let me know that, well, that was a very honest portrayal. Like, it might have been an aspect of this community that was like, listen, keep, I don't want to show my children snoring cocaine. I'd prefer it if you didn't. But for me, a young black male who had, who I thought three or four Asian friends, and I realized I just, they were more acquaintances, because I had no idea that they could possibly go home and be doing this. They could not possibly be going home and living a full life because my idea of what their life was was based on my experience and my opinion about who they are. And so if we as artists are brave enough to show all aspects of our lives, it kind of will loosen up uh, to a certain degree the white gaze because it's like, listen, anything negative that you think you can come up about us, we've already put out the honest portrayal of it. So if you want to talk about baby daddy drama, that is, you know, that might be part of our community, but there is, uh, there are a million different ways that baby mama and baby daddy drama starts. It's not just, I don't want to be in the house, I want to get a job. It's, right. I can't get a job. Yeah, she don't want me in the house. She's never yeah. had a man in the house. This man in her house is bothering her too much to stay in the house. <laughs> you know, she doesn't know how to, to operate and deal with this person. So we should tell those stories as well. Yes, my brother. Yeah, I just wanted to ask a question about, um, Specifically, you guys touched a little bit about the, the possibility of using alternative media now to kind of build um, like a, talk about Nollywood or a kind of like pan-African media type of thing going on. I just, and, and it was kind of, I heard it dismissed a little bit. And I just want to talk about the white gaze and its effect on the potential of non-white or black uh, institution building uh, by kind of 
claiming this like universality, right? We talked about the fact that just because it is like black people in it doesn't necessarily mean other black people would be watching it. But I just it's interesting that's never a question asked when we talk about anything white. You know what I mean? It's because, because this the idea of like the neutral, the universal is white. You know, and I just wonder sometimes because we are in this kind of media landscape when you do have this new black, even pan-African uh, uh, audience emerging, and there seems to be a hesitancy to like, well, that can't exist. And I just wonder, like, can I address some of that? I feel like I feel like the oftentimes uh, our institutions for for I'm speaking in terms of theater specifically, but I don't think it's a dynamic exclusive to theater. Sometimes part, our participation in it is like um, viewed as a means to an end, like the real end is to be Denzel, yeah. right? So I'm doing this play because I'm not Denzel yet, but I'm on my way. And when I get there, I don't come back and do the play. Like I don't have a subscription to an institution. Yeah. I don't go see anything there because I'm Denzel now, right? So there, there's actually, to me, there's a, a sense of, of, of using our institutions as stepping stones but not really investing and wanting to build them, um, ultimately. Because one of my questions, or one of my points was, you know, we're in this incredible digital age where the threshold of entry has so lowered itself, where anybody who wants to tell a story, write an article, publish a memoir, uh, whatever you, whatever expression that you want to have in terms of a storyteller, you can do. There's no one to stop you at all. Um, but yet, the barometer of success is whether or not you got the Pulitzer. Mm -hmm. And you're not going to get the Pulitzer mm -hmm. if you publish your book on Lulu.com. Mm -hmm. You're just not. <laughs> I try. Nobody <laughs> 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 called me. Nobody called me. So, <laughs> if, if we're constantly, um, which brings me to uh, one of my final questions for you all. Uh, really our definition of success. How do you view success within the white gaze, within your truth gaze, and within the new revolution? Where Elaine Locke in 1925 said in his book, Nature of the New Negro. Therefore the Negro today wishes to be known for what he is. This is 1925, y'all. Mm. Even in his faults and shortcomings and scorns and craven and precarious survival at the price of seeming to be what he is not. He now becomes a conscious contributor and lays aside the status of beneficiary and ward for that of collaborator and participant in American civilization. Where do you see, what, how do you divine that success? I want to hear from everybody too, so don't. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, uh, it's funny you bring up the Pulitzer because um, I, you know, when I'm talking about that I'm focused on my characters, I don't think about that white gaze. But that is the place where it's sort of like the recognition which comes from uh, the fact that it's been given to a few people of color makes it suddenly feel like it's for everybody. Mm -hmm. And obviously it's not. And who are the people making those decisions? And so, uh, I may not be thinking about that white gaze when I'm writing, but later I'm waiting to see. You know? <laughs> it's like, yeah. Do they like it? It's true. Do you like me? Yeah. I mean, it's not conscious yeah. thinking about that, but it is certainly that where are all those accolades coming from, really? And again, as they say, that I, uh, it's almost if it were only given to white people, you could then sort of say, well, that's, you know, you that's get rid of it. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yes, and you could just be more dismissive of it, but because of there's enough little carrot sticks out there because mm. of it happening, then suddenly uh, you do sort of buy into that it's uh, you know that it's fair for everyone. And the truth is, I think that uh, um, it's not that it isn't given to people of color, but then it becomes you know. 
whose Who turn? is lauded? Yes, exactly. And, and <laughs> whose turn is it? You yeah. know, um, uh, uh, history of history of seven killings. The, um, they never given a um, Booker to a Caribbean writer before, and so it's you know who's which person of color's turn it is. You can't but all then. Come. Like yeah, yeah, yeah. Or which, I'm sorry to say, which community? Which I mean, community? Which community? Yeah. And so, uh, because it's the because it's the person of color's turn, and then <laughs> which community gets it? We go Asian. Yeah, Asian, yeah South exactly. Asian, black, so, um, what kind of black? Good question. <laughs> um, as we pass it, I just want to interject here this this concept of like who is lauded and what and what for and why, um, how all of those things kind of play into the white gaze as well. Uh, just wanted to throw that out there. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, this is some shit I'm really trying to work through right now. Because in the three whole months before the book actually comes out, I can get to think about all of this and think about how I want it to be received and all of that. Um, and I'm like, they're not going to give me a National Book Award. They gave ta one. They ain't going to do two brothers in a row. They're going to have it. Well, it's interesting to play on Broadway now. Uh, the Nagritas, uh Eclipse is on Broadway now, but Eclipse has been a play for quite some time, for years, and it got no love because they were like, we can't have two African stories at the same. Because of ruin. Because of ruin. Yeah. Um, and I'm thinking through it, uh, you know, I really want a New York Times bestseller. That's a goal of mine. If everyone in here goes and pre-orders it right now, <laughs> I have a chance. You'll <laughs> we'll be well on your way. <laughs> um, but ultimately, um, you know, I'm good with it. I gave it to the people that I most respect, and they said all the things about it that I needed them to say. And I'm good now. Uh, still on the New York Times bestseller, but like, why as do you want New York Times bestseller? What is that going to do for you? Then we get into all types of practical considerations in terms of, oh, if it's a New York Times bestseller, that means my speaking fee goes up. Sorry, Keith. Um, <laughs> you got him, Keith. Yeah, and then I don't have to write another book for a long time because I can just go out and speak forever. I, you know, it's it's. I mean. But also, I mean, there's prestige to yeah. it, you know. It's like... So ultimately, we're, we're suddenly back around to the idea that you want to be respected. Absolutely. And, and yes, the, the, the sort of barometer of what respect looks like is based on things that are dependent upon the white gaze because we're not, we haven't escaped that. Um, but, you know, also, I mean, that, de that again depends on where you're where you're drawing those lines. Like, in a professional context, I, I understand uh, those accolades uh, that are bestowed upon institutions that are largely white um, have a certain meaning. But, you know, if I get an NAACP image, well, I'm gonna celebrate the shit out of that too. Like, you know what I mean? Like, it, it's, um, an achievement for me is an achievement, uh, but certain ones do practically just carry more weight, yeah. with, uh, you know, outside of um, my own sort of personal uh, joy that 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 they will bring. So I mean, it, it's a Tony or an Adele, for example. Yeah. Right. Essentially. Essentially what we're saying is there you still have no, we've not escaped the white gaze. We are still um, beholden to it no matter the, the level that you reach. You are beholden to the idea of acceptance on the basis of, of the of the standard that the white gaze has set. So yeah, we, we like pine after those things. Um, but ultimately, you know, you do have to find that center of yourself. That says what does what is the what is the actual meaning there? It's not actually meaningful to me if I get a national book award or become a finalist or what. I, I don't actually care. What I do care about is that when this book comes out, um, you're able to hand it to a 17-year-old black boy who's, uh, you know, could be a Trayvon Martin, 
and is able to find a sense of self and, and and value himself in this world that will try to kill him and be able to walk through with a new understanding of who he is, what history is steeped in, and where we need to go. Like that's ultimately what's most meaningful. Yes, question here. I want to say what about you. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> no, it, mine real quickly. Uh, success is peace, and however you find that, you know, uh, whatever, wherever okay. you find your, your, your peaceful place. Uh, as artists, you put art out into the world, and people have opinions about it, one way or the other. Uh, whether you value that person's opinion or not, they exist, and that's the point. That's part of how what happens when you put art out. So once it is released into the world, I'm okay with it. What other people think about it who I don't know or anything like that, uh, it doesn't affect me as much. And as far as the accolades are concerned, we all know what they do for us on a very practical level. You win an Oscar. Uh, well, for black actors, you I'm and Oscar, sure. that's, the, that's, that's it for you. Yeah. Go bye bye. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But um, you know, certain things do. Uh, yeah, seriously. Certain things do up your ante, and um, and for me, it gives it would give me more creative, uh, more leverage to nation build. You know, more leverage to to. I know for a fact that I tell my agents all the time: one for me, I mean, one for you, two for me. You know, mm-hmm. so you do the one that you, you know, may have to sacrifice to get a little money for, yeah. and then you do two indies that uh, where you get to live a, a real life, and ultimately those are the ones that feed you creatively, and those are the ones that help a young filmmaker coming up, mm-hmm. uh, because who might have had to use his homeboy, now he's got a dude who's on television and in movies in his movie who attracts other actors like that, yeah. and now you're nation building, but at the same time you're taking care of home. And uh, so you have to figure out where you find that peace. And to me, that is successful uh, because you, you're able to make an impact to, to a certain degree. Go for it. So as a university professor, I, I have the privilege of teaching your work in the film you're in, your text, um, your, your plays. And I want to have a sense of how you see your work relationship to black critics and Ooh. academics who are in many ways making sure that we'll get to that young person uh, by putting our syllabus. Uh, and there's so many more of us now who are you know, doing that kind of work. Um, so I want to have a sense of, because the way you is what the critic, right? Yeah. You know, that role to voice other who get the work um, published and we've talked about. So the more we put it on the syllabus, bring it up to you, Tiana, to <laughs> give a talk, um, the more <laughs> we get a chance to um, play a role, too. So I want to have a sense of how black film producers see um, black and, um, critics can break you down and stop you, literally. Um, I got a, I have a play going on in Chicago now. I got a review, a woman who said, who said it was a bad play. Do not go see it. Was it a black woman? No. Actually, right. I, actually yeah. I don't know if she was yeah. black. I don't know her race. Yeah. I don't know her race. What page? It was um it was a blog. It was like a like a radio blog in Chicago. And she said it was bad. And and because, you know, theaters are in the business in the business of theater, they you, you can they see the dip in the box office, you know, directly. Um, at the same time, having my work read in university settings is actually quite validating. Um, because there is value there beyond whether or not you like it. See, what I think is that she didn't like it, and that's fine, but that doesn't mean it's a bad play. It means that you don't like it. Yeah. So, which leads me to the question, why don't you like it? Uh, am I saying something that you don't like? Is it a world view? Is it a gaze that you're not familiar with? Um, et cetera. <laughs> um, yeah, that's my response. Um, uh, my novel that just came out, um, I, I, when the book launch happened, Rob and Kelly, uh, we had a one-on-one because he read the book and wrote a really nice blurb on it. So uh, that was fantastic because he so understood the book. And of course, um, uh, which is, 
it's not about the white gays, but it's about race. <laughs> Majorly about race. And, uh, and uh, I, so that was fantastic because he asked great questions. He you know, came from, he teaches at USC LA and he came over to do that. You know, it's interesting because uh, it's a funny thing since it's going to hell around live, but um, it had a review by somebody who, um, a big review as somebody who is apparently a black writer. We sort of found that out by uh, looking him up. And most of it, uh, yeah. <laughs> and most of it was very positive. Uh, interestingly, um, there was, uh, <laughs> one of the things that he had a problem with was he said some of uh, the language was a little, he didn't say incomprehensible, but he talked about more it was, you know, a, a puzzle to figure out. Um, it was the black characters that he had trouble on. <laughs> and nobody else had, uh, and it was actually, now to be fair, it was a child, a very hyper child. And so it was also kind of a stream of consciousness of a black child in 1942. But, um, but it was interesting because Nobody, white or black, seemed to have that same comment when they read it. And so truthfully, it, you just don't know where people are coming from and who on his staff does he have to impress because he's part of a uh, community of other critics, yeah, uh, which are probably yeah. not mostly white because this paper is the New York Times. And so, um, so um, I, you know, and I'm not complaining. It was mostly a really good review, but it was really interesting because I was also thinking about, uh, you know, I appreciated most of it was very good, but I was also kind of aware of where he may have been coming from as a black um, critic. Uh, and a newish black critic because uh, they didn't uh, know his name before uh, at my publisher um, in such a mainstream institution. So, uh, black gays. Can you give you a positive review? Yeah, just to say that no, was great. Right, no, actually, no, it was actually really mostly positive. Uh, but it was just interesting that the. the we were like saying this because it's going to be like it's public, you know, like recorded, whatever. But what he, the questions he had seemed to be at least some of like the black things, the, the blacker things. Very personal. Um, I wonder. It was interesting. It was interesting. But, when it comes to. But I appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> I <don't say> that. <laughs> I think when, when it comes to like black critics, uh, so to speak, I. I You know, uh, it, it, it engages with it some kind of way. But I'm really interested in black critics' opinion of my work or because I'm black. And, and I, one of the things I find out now being on the BET show is that that audience is not the black audience that I had when I was the black guy on Southland. Completely different audience. So the stuff that people at BET, the critics or the people who are fancy themselves Twitter critics, uh, the stuff that they value is much different. Yeah, it's much different than the things that are valued on this end. And that's the beautiful thing that I like about criticism and opinions is that it, everyone speaks from their own personal experience. And the beauty of black people being on two opposite ends of the spectrum just is, it speaks to the, the gamut of experiences that we have. Mm -hmm. And I think that we're often allowed to explore the minutia of white life in the world. So we're used to, well, this guy's an independent critic. This guy's this, this guy's that. But they want a black critic is supposed to like your black ass. <laughs> <laughs> you know? <laughs> and sometimes he just does it. You know, if, if your reference point is Ralph Ellison, their reference point might be Donald Goins. Right. They're gonna have very different opinions. But they're both extremely black. <laughs> and they're both extremely relevant, yeah. but they're just different. And so I, I love that aspect, and I love the fact that we're able to kind of interact in that way. So what, what's that, though, is that sometimes larger institutions do have an impact, an adverse impact on something that could easily have a life 
with its audience that won't get that life because the New York Times said or the Wall Street Journal said. I have one more question. Uh, two more questions. One. Okay, one more question. Okay. Um, I wanted to ask you in regard to you were talking about with your novel that you were so involved with the characters that you weren't thinking about or weren't aware of the white days. And you mentioned there's two black characters. I mean, all I say is that I was just aware of the characters. I don't really go outside but I, of I was just wondering how you sit, because apparently there's black and white in, in your novel. Um, but does it come out anyway, even if you're not consciously aware of the white gaze, since you're dealing with black and white in your novel? I mean, again, it's sort of like, I, sometimes I'm not quite sure uh, like how we're defining white gaze. My novel is about bitterly rabid violent racism, okay? <laughs> so, uh, does that mean it's all about the, the white gaze? I don't know, I mean, it's definitely about racism. I, I guess it depends on how you define that. I, all I'll say is that when I was writing each character, all I was thinking of is what was going through his head. One of the characters, as a matter of fact, is, uh, grows up, and there's, you know, <laughs> like me and the Brady Bunch, assimilationists, and I was, that's part of it, but I, um, yeah, I mean, I guess we could say, I guess, that 24-7 we are completely under a white gaze all the time, and in that case, it is, but I guess all I'm, all I'm saying is that I was not in any way self-conscious when I wrote thinking, oh, wait a minute, I better not write that because of what somebody will think. I just wrote with the character. Yeah, yeah. I didn't yeah. mean it was changing anything, but just, especially about racism, but just, it, it must be part of the work in some way, right? I guess it depends on how you define white gays, well, I guess. You grew up in this world, you know, so in no sense, right? You would, if they're on planet Earth. I mean, let me say, the characters were certainly under the white gaze in many ways, because it was Jim Crow South, a lot of it. So I would certainly say that. Whether I was, no, I don't, if I was, weren't, yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. Last question, go for it. I just want to say, because I'm like, I'm like <laughs> that's all you. It's in you, it's in you, whatever that white gaze is, whatever you really think about it, it's in your subconscious, it doesn't even need to be conscious. My view of the white gaze is very different because I'm English, but there is a view. And when I write, it comes out, even if I'm not consciously thinking about it, when Beyonce sings, she's not thinking about all the seven notes or the eight notes of the scope, it's, it's in her, she, it just comes out. So I think that to sort of think it's this conscious thing is like, you know, like there's loads of white people who don't think they're racist. It's racist. Racism is very, um, it's not just a man with a white mask, you know, with this, you know, it's very, um, it's very, what's the word? It's very nuanced. nuanced. So I feel like if you're an artist, your, your view of it's coming out, you're spitting it out, even if you're not even, do you know what I mean? I think it's so subconscious. I mean, this is or, or it's literally conscious. I mean, I know artists who are like, I gotta get some white people to come see my show. Oh, yeah. Yeah. What can I do to get some white people to come see my show? Well, white people will know it. They will know that you're pandering. That's, that's you. <laughs> I'm like, please come see my show. Yeah, it's so obvious. Yeah, I, I think, think so. When, when pandering happens, the audience is smart. They know when people are trying to play them for a fool. I yeah. think. I like to think that. I mean, how many yeah. black movies have you seen where they make, where it's a white movie, but they make the character black? Yes. That movie usually sucks, man. Yeah. <laughs> because it doesn't work. Because they didn't take into account the specificity. They just replaced the, the colored yeah. faces. All right, we're live tweeting. You should tweet. <laughs> you should stream on HellRound. And we're going to wrap up our time here. I'd like to thank our panelists. <laughs>